All right. So uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. So um, I'll tell you about some of the things that have already come up. So my the previous speakers have done a great job of introducing many of the things that I need now. What, what we have to model for, for example, binary system is the gravitational wave signal, which you see in a, in a movie here. So this is the gravitational waves on the celestial sphere as a function of time. This is, in the end, what we have to, what we have to describe. Now, uh, there's many, many, many sources that we, uh, we hope to measure. But as the previous speakers, I'm going to uh, mostly focus on binaries and even more so on black holes. Um, because uh, this is for simplicity and many of the matter effects are all, all very interesting. Uh, in some sense, adding standard, almost standard uh, computational fluid dynamics to this general picture here. So as you have seen, oops, sorry. As you have seen, in order to identify these sources, we have to do basically two things. One is we have to understand the signals. So, so we need to compute these signals across some large parameter space of masses and spins, for example. The other thing is that we also have to understand the, the, the noise. And that's what Andy is going to talk about afterwards. Uh, and then we have to solve for the gravitational wave, but also maybe the multi messenger signals from these extreme astrophysical events that we're interested in. In particular, in general relativity, if we could also in alternative theories of gravity, for example, for black holes. And if you don't have black holes, but you have neutral stars, supernovae, or other things, then we have to include matter effects as well. Um, in general, what, what the approach one is doing is one can use some t different types of perturbation theory, which would give you results, for example, if the objects are very far away from each other, but then when they're very close, in the most uh, violent phase of these events, you need to use uh, high performance computing to solve your underlying equation, like the Einstein equations, directly. And then from these two uh, input types of input to your models, you have to synthesize a final model for some class of events that you're interested in, for example, um, roughly comparable mass uh, binary black holes. And then you still have to implement this and test this in the LIGO Virgo data analysis infrastructure. All right, so we have seen uh, these types of uh, wavy signals before. So now there's no noise, and this is the pure uh, physical signal that we expect. And so this could be, this, this picture here could be the signal as it's seen in the detector, in particular for binaries which do not show spin precession and you see them face on or face off, so basically along the poles more or less. Or it could also be the L equal to M equal to spherical harmonic component in co-rotating coordinates that would pretty much also look like this. When the uh, objects are far away from each other, then you, what we call the in-spiral, then you can use post-Newtonian perturbation theory to describe the signal or a certain variant of this, which is called effective one body description. But then when the uh, objects are closer to each other, a few orbits before they merge, this approximation breaks down. There's no analytical model. And you have to use numerical relativity, which, which means solving the Einstein equations as partial differential equation uh, to get out your output. And at the end, you can use partial results, again, from perturbation theory for this ring down. But you have to compute, for example, the amplitude and phase uh, numerically. This is a, a picture that has come up uh, some, a few times. No, not as a picture, as in text. So here you see the sensitivity of some detectors, which are, these are the noise curves, and lower is better. And here you see three spectra of uh, three different events with different masses. And what has been said before is basically if the mass is smaller, then they shift to higher frequencies, which is here to the right. And so for, for larger masses, for example, like the ones that we have detected uh, first for black holes, you see your merger ring down directly where you have base sensitivity. And for high masses, maybe your your merger is already high, hidden in the noise. There has been some comparison, for example, of this uh, perturbative description. And so basically, if your total mass is larger than about 10, 12 solar masses, you do need numerical relativity, which describes this final part of the process, because you get a lot of signal to noise ratio from this region. Now, solving the Einstein equations for black holes has, a kind of, uh, has been some kind of holy grail uh, problem. It took about four years since the mid-60s uh, to be able to do this. Now, G GR is a very, very elegant uh, theory, very simple to write down. The Einstein equations, if you write them as tensors, they're quite uh, easy to write. One tensor is equal to some other tensor. But if you <laughs> write this out in coordinates explicitly, it gets very, very complicated. You get hundreds of terms. You have a large degree of complexity. Uh, there are many aspects of this, writing this out as partial differential equations, which are similar to computational fluid dynamics problems, uh, but there are lots of extra 
extra um, features. Now, the first time, basically, like three quarters of an orbit and the gravitational wave signal could be calculated was in a breakthrough work in 2005. You see here, for, for three different resolutions, for example, the, uh, the from like three quarters of an orbit, and you see the signal. This is what we can do a bit more than 10 years later. This is just one, one example for large mass ratios. This cost about, these are two or three resolutions on top of each other. You don't see the difference. And producing this cost about a million hours a few years ago. Uh, and you, you see that we basically just had about 10 years from the first simulation to reasonably mature models that give you the inspiral, the merger, and the ring down as they have been used in the first science run. And we had about 10 years. So this is basically just three PhD theses to develop this field. Uh, now, a little bit about how, in principle, we solve the Einstein equations. So if you want to do this systematically, you have to provide some initial value formulation. So if this is a cartoon picture of your space-time, four-dimensional, which is with um, some uh, dimensions suppressed here, you have to slice, you have to induce a time coordinate, t. You have to slice, and each of these slices here will be three-dimensional space at different times. And then you solve your, you have to do some initial data, you solve your equations forward in time. So essentially, if you choose some coordinate systems for your space-time, the Einstein equations become a set of 10 coupled nonlinear second-order partial differential equations. Problem is, the properties of the PDEs depend a lot on your choice, choice of coordinates. You can get different types of PDE systems. Also, GR is a gauge theory, like the uh, Maxwell equations for electrodynamics, or Young-Mills for quantum chromodynamics. And this means that your initial value problem has constraints, in this case four, because you can choose four coordinates, which means your initial data are not free, but they have to sort of satisfy certain conditions like the divergence constraints in electrodynamics. In electrodynamics, it's very well understood how to preserve those, because your constraints will not be satisfied exactly, just approximately, and then your evolution algorithm has to make sure that the violation of the constraints doesn't grow in time. In ENM, people know how to do this. In GR, we don't really. Essentially, uh, you have to massage your, your equations and hope that in a certain class of interesting spacetimes, your errors don't grow exponentially, but maybe rather decay. But it, generically, they will drift away exponentially. So key, for, key efforts uh, until this, before this breakthrough in 2005 was, for example, find a well-posed initial value problem, uh, first order in time or, or uh, in first and second order in space. Usually you have to solve about 20 or so, 20 or more PDEs concurrently, the different types of systems that are used, and it's basically generalized wave equations. So if you don't have matter, you don't have shocks. Um, then find appropriate gauge conditions that give you black holes, and, and then solve this, at least for some examples, solve this problem with uh, constraints. Now, I have to talk about singularities and black holes, because even if, uh, at some level, the Einstein equations are just nonlinear, a system of nonlinear wave equations, they have some strange feature <laughs> which is singularities and black holes. So they are, black holes are the quintessential objects of gravitational wave physics in particular, uh, in, in their coalescence, but also as the end product of neutron star mergers or supernovae, for example. Uh, the black hole horizon is, is a surface that's basically moving outward at the speed of light. Uh, it's a, like a one-way causal membrane. If you have perturbations from outside, they will arrive at the horizon with a large blue shift, which can give you trouble uh, numerically. And because it's an outward growing uh, uh, surface at the speed of light, you have to choose your coordinate system to keep, it basically to keep its size constant and prevent it from eating up your grid, which, which means uh, you need some basically superluminal coordinate shifts, which can give you also lots of trouble um, numerically. And there are basically two strategies to avoid simulating the interior of a black hole, which is much, much worse than having a horizon because we know that it has to harbor a singularity, which you can't really handle by the computer. So one is the excision technique, where you know that basically all the information is flowing into the horizon, which is called a pure outflow boundary, and you basically just kind of cut a hole in your computational domain, and all the information you know is streaming into that black hole. In practice, this is quite complicated because you have to make sure that this hole in your computational domain is in the, in the, in the right place, and you have to use uh, sophisticated control systems to get this. The other thing, which doesn't require you to punch a hole in your computational domain, is what is called singularity, avoiding slices. And I have a contour here of this. So, so this would be a space coordinate. This would be a time coordinate. Uh, so this would be a three-dimensional space. And so I would choose a time coordinate that are, are space-like slices that just wrap around the singularity. 
and you don't actually run into the singular part. Now this looks like your coordinates and your metric should be very, very distorted, which is what people used to believe has to happen, like uh, some kind of spaghetti <laughs> that forms, but it was actually, uh, so we were involved in this, we were able to show that this doesn't have to happen. You can, you can get uh, this kind of very strange uh, but convenient type of coordinate system and you can write your, the, the, um, the functions that you have to evolve, they can be perfectly time independent and nicely behaved. Um, now, if you actually want to do cal these uh, calculations, there are lots of uh, different scales that you have to handle, which means you need mesh refinement. Um, so you know, solutions are smooth as, as long as you don't have matter. So you can use high order finite differencing or, or spectral methods if you want, are appropriate. But you have these length scales, so individual black holes, they're the most compact objects in nature, so they're very, very small. Uh, and you have to resolve them well to accurately, to accurately track the motion of the black holes, which determines your, the phase of your gravitational wave. So how accurately you track the holes is the main source of error for gravitational wave data analysis. Then you have the, the scale of the orbit, uh, you have the scale of the waves, you have some overall one over distance to the end background fall off, and usually you don't have very uh, physical boundary conditions, so you want to move your boundaries very far away to causally isolate them from the interior region of the grid where interesting things are going on. And so you need spatial and temporal mesh refinement, and usually we do this in a very aggressive way, and so usual codes that are used in the field maybe for production simulations, maybe you have 70, 80 percent of scaling, that's where we usually operate. Um, all right. So here's, just, here's two, two scaling plots. They're both a bit older, but they give you the basic feeling. If, if, you, uh, if you use a, a weak scaling test without uh, mesh refinement, uh, everything is wonderful. You scale up very uh, flat scaling up to thousands and thousands, of course. But in the actual typical operations that we have, uh, depends on what uh, the grid sizes are, but somewhere at, sorry, somewhere at 300, 400, 500 cores, your, your uh, scaling degenerates. But usually production simulations, they, they have roughly this, this number of, so a few hundred cores is what we usually uh, use. Now, a little bit about the numerics. So the main uh, paradigms at the moment is basically finite differencing in a general coordinate uh, setup, how you write your equations, which is called moving punctures. And there is, a, I wrote A in quotes for AMR, because you use what is actually called fi fixed mesh refinement. Since you basically, where you need mesh refinement moves with your compact objects, with your, blo with your holes, you don't really need full adaptive mesh refinement. You know where the objects are, and you can just move your refinement boxes with the objects. Um, and then you have this kind of cartoonish picture. You have fine grids, you have coarse grids. The fine grids usually evolve twice as fast as the coarse grids. You have to move information between these grids. Um, and then you would either have to use very high order uh, time interpolation, which tends to build, um, tends to get unstable, or what is done in practice, you use lots of buffer zones for the fine grid and then temporal and spatial um, interpolation. The problem is that either you use a lot of buffer zones to not lose uh, finite difference or order, or you, uh, you lose, this would be, a, for example, for sixth order finite difference, which is like the standard finite difference thing order that we use you would have to use 32 buffer zones on each side of your grid to kill all the second order effects. So usually people just use less and to have some second order effects it might give you some trouble with convergence tests. And another, another way is uh, that's particular in the, in, the, in the form of the spec code which is used in the community. This is a, a spectral code, multi-domain spectral code. You have plenty and plenty of domains um, and you use standard spectral uh, collocation methods. One of the uh, advantages here is that also because you don't really care about scaling, it's very efficient, in particular if you want to do long in spirals, that's very efficient, you have very little high frequency noise, whereas the other uh, approach, fine difference is basically, it's very simple, it's very robust, it's both suitable for small teams, but also they're open source code which you can use for basically industrial application in gravitational wave uh, astronomy. Uh, but, but key weaknesses, I would say, for the, for the fine difference codes is certainly a lack of optimization, the, the issue with the buffer zones, whereas for the other spectral approach at the moment, it's still a, a lack of robustness. So you need lots of people to make sure you actually get some uh, simulations going. There are lots of new technolo technologies which are getting ready, got lurking methods, buffer zone reduction, all kinds of things, but they're only very slowly propagating through to uh, production codes. 
I'm not going to talk about this. This is just a, a quick overview of some of the infrastructure, computational infrastructure, which is available, which is either open source or easily available to um, collaborators or different codes you can get for finite difference methods or spectral. And I want to talk about the binary black hole parameter space. Now, Jen, all right, thanks. Now, so our results, they scale with mass. For, for the detection, that the mass is very important because the mass tells you how you shift relative in frequency to your detector sensitivity. But for calculating the signals in the Einstein equations, the mass is just the scale factor. Unless you have matter, then things are a little bit more complicated. And so you have to deal with uh, seven dimensions, which is mass ratio and six spin components. And then if you actually want to deal with uh, eccentricity, you have two more. Uh, precession, if you have all six spin components, can give you very complicated gravitational wave signals and very complicated orbital dynamics. But there's a simple three-dimensional subspace, which is when your spins are aligned with the orbital momentum, then you preserve your orbital plane and both the dynamics and the waves are much, much simpler. And then they look like these kind of wavy things which we have seen before, very simple. Now, exploring the parameter space of general relativity for black holes is very expensive. So at the current level of technology, simulations may consume up to several hundred thousand core hours. If you have high mass ratios and very large spins, even more. And so I think a very, very rough <laughs> estimate of how much time has been spent on this in total up to now is maybe on the order of like a bit less, maybe than 10 to the 9 core hours. But this is a very rough estimate. Just to give you an, uh, an impression of how much work have, uh, people have put into this so far. And then also, as you've heard before, uh, extending your calculation, in particular numerical relativity, to lower frequencies is very expensive because, it start, it, because the time to coalescence scales with the frequency to minus 8 over 3. You've seen this in the slide before. And also, there's a scaling with the mass ratio that you've seen before. So if, the, the, uh, if they're very unequal, it takes a lot longer. And then what you basically do is your first step is you have some kind of grid in your high dimensional parameter space where you have the last 5, 10, maybe 30 orbits that you have solved directly in Einstein equations. And then you, what do you call it, hybridize, which basically means glue those together with post-Newtonian perturbative waveforms. I have two such examples here. So you would have, for example, this part simulated in numerical relativity. Then you have a long post-Newtonian in spiral, and over these few cycles, we have glued these two waveforms together. And as you can see, in this case, this is a pretty smooth uh, transition because we have started uh, far enough and at large enough distance that the post-Newtonian prescription is already reasonably OK. Now, I have to, so now this uh, still may actually pretty, sound pretty hopeless because I've said that the processing, the processing parameter space has seven dimensions, and it's very hard to explore with numerical methods, which cost uh, 100,000 hours each. Okay? And so there, is, there are some shortcuts available, which are already used now in data analysis. So we can, people, we can give data analysis now something which can approximately handle uh, precession and does incorporate numerical relativity um, information, but just where you really need it. And the basic idea is that if the orbital time scale which would show if the orbital time scale is much smaller than some other time scale of precession, which means the time scale of your spins moving around and of your orbital plane moving around, then if you would imagine you're in, in some kind of co-rotating frame with your binary, which has this very complicated motion, then the radiated angular momentum and the radiated energy doesn't depend much on this shaking around of your orbital plane and and this loss of energy, which basically tells the binary how fast it spirals together, in some sense is unaffected by precession. And so what you can then do with this is you can construct some approximate map from non-processing to processing. Or basically, you, you take a non-processing case and sort of twist this up with the Euler angles that you can compute from a perturbative prescription. This has a number of uh, shortcuts, but this is what is uh, uh, used in many of the models which are used already now for data analysis. Also, the, uh, your quadrupole L equal 2, M equal plus minus 2 um, harmonic is not everything. You want to also model subdominant harmonics, and there's a similar shortcut that you can use to handle those as well. Yeah, so this, this just shows you how, basically, if, you're, if, you're inclined, if you don't look at things uh, 
face on or face off, uh, you get this where you would get this very loud uh, red signal. You get something which is a weaker signal, but it's much more complicated. And in order to resolve the blue signal, you have to treat your subdominant harmonics. All right. So now let's make a brief overview of how you actually do the waveform modeling. The, the first kind of model, I think, for anything from these numerical simulations was actually modeling the recoil, the final velocity of the merger signal. And see, this, this was the fir first uh, thing that we did about 12 years ago. And you see, we, we've simulated lots of data points which, because we thought that the functional dependence may be very complicated. In fact, it's quite simple. So there's a tendency for rather smooth behavior. However, in the end, you have to model several functions across a seven-dimensional parameter space. You have a large parameter space problem. Now, what you do is you want to model simple functions. So you split your waveform, as it has been mentioned before by Alex. You split into amplitude and phase, or, for example, into the Hamiltonian and the flux of some underlying perturbative model. And then you model these simple functions. You can do this in the frequency domain or in the time domain. And then you have, you have some simple functions that you have to model, which there are many ways of doing this. You can reduce them to the coefficients in some phenomenological, phenomenological ansatz. You can just grid them up, like Alex does for the, the search templates. Uh, you can construct basis functions from waveforms. These are the main uh, approaches you can do. And then if you model this, you have to basically ensure that you avoid both underfitting, not getting all the information out that you have in your numerical simulations, and overfitting this to noise and systematic errors. And you have to do this, achieve this over a large parameter space. An example, what you could do, for example, which we have better methods, we could grid up your amplitude and phase with tens of frequency data points, interpolate these with polynomials maybe, and reconstruct the waveform as a spline. This would be a simple model. In a, in a small neighborhood of parameter space, that would work fine, but we do usually come more complicated things. So there are three basic me uh, strategies that just have different emphasis. So there's the effective one body description, which basically tries to push perturbative methods as far as possible, and models the energy and flux of a particle, and then integrates the ODEs numerically. This is a very nice method, but it's also very slow, and then you need a second step to make it fast. Then there's what is called phenomenological models. These are so far mostly developed in the frequency domain, but you could also do it in the time domain. They focus on the phenomenological understanding, and they give you piecewise two, three uh, regions, piecewise uh, analytical functions, which we can evaluate very fast. And there's something which is called surrogate models, which basically uses uh, reduced order, <coughs> reduced order models, models either directly for the numerical data or for some extra data, for example, this uh, EOB methods, which you still have to accelerate. Uh, the last one doesn't in use any intermediate phenomenological model. It just uh, use, you know, directly works with whatever data you provide. And then these two, they have both some physically motivated ansatz in terms of some suitable parameters. You fit these parameters to each waveform, and then you fit them across the parameter space, so in two steps. Uh, just to illustrate how this works for the phenom approach, because that's the one that I'm involved in, but the, the ideas are quite similar to the EOB. So you have some simple functions. In this case, it's the phase, or phase derivative and the amplitude in the frequency domain. You split this up into different regions, frequency regions. The more regions you split it up, the simpler each region gets. Um, so we choose, we choose three. That's a reasonable compromise. This in spiral and then basically merger and ring down, and in each region, region you have some physical uh, intuition that helps you to make a model, and typically we need on the order of like 10 parameters for each function, which means about three parameters for each piece, okay? Um, so, and in the, the basic idea in EOB is kind of similar. And then you have to uh, carry out this modeling over your parameter space. So for example, you will start, okay, uh, you will start with the L equal M equal to spherical harmonic. So you do just one harmonic, just one amplitude and one phase. And then you go by dimension. So you start with non-spinning. You have one, a one-dimensional problem, non-processing spins uh, with some effective spin, two-dimensional. Leading precession effects, you have actually five harmonics. The non-processing spins, one harmonic, 3D, and so on and so on. Uh, this is roughly where we are now. And what we haven't done yet is a calibration to precision effects, which would be seven-dimensional, and generic black holes with, with uh, eccentricity, which would be 9D. And then, of course, all of these steps, you want to improve them with time as the 
accuracy of the detectors improves. Um, now this, I want, I'll just, uh, don't want to spend much time on this, that this, uh, one of the issues that you have is with this dimensionality is, is uh, how to approach it better you would dimension, when you approach all the dimensions at the same time, another approach is basically you split it up in dimensions and you just go so in such a way that you always deal just with 1D or 2D problems at a time. Uh, this is some of the results of one of the approaches. The only thing that's really interesting here is basically they'll say, you know, this would be for, this would be the previous model, which is about two or three years old, and there's a new one. So 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 you get about two orders of accuracy in two or three years. This is the kind of the time scale on which we are improving things. And so here have a few um, challenges, a selection of challenges for the future, both in numerical relativity and in waveform modeling. Thank you.